Praise the Lord. If you'll open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to continue in our series. Today, you could title this uh, message, How to Regard Leaders. Simple message. The passage that we're going to read, the first 13 verses of chapter 4. In this passage, there are three paragraphs. And there are also three warnings. Two of them are explicit. One of them is implicit. And I'm going to begin now to read this text, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And Paul writes, This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that ye did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all like men sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. All right, let's remember the larger context. If you have not been with us, and even if you have, remember, Paul is addressing in these first four chapters a serious problem in the church in Corinth, divisions in the church. Divisions, contentions, dissensions, disunity. How does Paul handle the problem of divisions? Well, first, by bringing them back to the gospel message, the basic true wisdom of Christ crucified. Because the wisdom of God, the gospel of God, centers in a crucified Messiah, which really is an oxymoron, isn't it? But secondly, after bringing them back to the basic gospel message, Paul begins, and he started this in chapter 3, to explain to them the nature of true Christian leadership. Because They had been lining up behind favorite leaders and saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, these first verses deal again with Christian leadership. Paul is picking up on what he began to talk about in the last part of chapter 3. Covenant Life Church, my friends, you who have been with us for a while know that we have gone through a challenging decade. 
We have seen some divisions. We have experienced some of this. So this may fall in the category of closing the stable door after the horse has already bolted. But I do think that we have been chastened. And I do think that we have benefited. We have right now a good degree of unity in our church. But certainly we have not arrived. And even if we had, there's still the issue of the church beyond our doors, the body of Christ universal that we're a part of, that we care about. And so this passage can help us to, as Paul said in Ephesians, maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, which takes a little bit of work, doesn't it? It's a great deal of effort. We can make every effort to maintain this unity of the Spirit and also to help us in relating to our brothers and sisters who are not a part of this church but who are part of the body of Christ. Because this issue of unity is very important to God and it should be important to us as well. So, remember now, The division that we're talking about took that form of people lining behind favorite leaders. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, that is Peter. And they had this mentality, we're the best, the heck with the rest. It's not the kind of attitude that Christians should have. Because behind these divisions were worldly ways of thinking. And worldly wisdom puts a premium on outward success. And in so doing, they were failing to understand the wisdom of God, a wisdom that finds expression in, of all places, a crucified Messiah. That's the gospel of God, Christ crucified. It is indeed an unexpected kind of wisdom. Paul calls it in Romans 16, a mystery of God. And he refers to that again here in chapter 4 as the mystery of God. I mean, to the world's way of thinking, a message about a supposed Messiah, a supposed king who was crucified, a king who came to die, does not make much sense. It sounds weak. It sounds foolish. It is an unimpressive message. And as Kevin said a few weeks ago, this unimpressive message comes to an unimpressive people, the Corinthians. However much they may have applauded themselves, there were not many wise, there were not many mighty, there were not many noble. And this gospel message came to them through the preaching of an unimpressive preacher, Paul, by his own estimation and admission. So an unimpressive message to an unimpressive people by an unimpressive preacher. But Christ crucified is the wisdom of God and the power of God to those who are being saved. Because, you see, this crucified king rose from the dead. He's no longer dead. And this gospel, unimpressive as it may sound, saves from the guilt of of sin and the dominion of sin. It saves from eternal death. It brings the gift of eternal life. It is the ultimate answer of a loving and just God to a rebellious people who are trapped in sin and unrighteousness. It saves from the wrath of God. It justifies. It sanctifies. And my friends, if you will believe this message, it will get you into heaven and nothing else will. That's the gospel. That's the weak and foolish gospel of our salvation. So Paul brings them back to the gospel. But in addition to bringing them back to the gospel, they needed some lessons in leadership. They needed to know what true leadership in the church looks like. They were childish in their understanding of it. They were living like mere men. 1 Corinthians 3, the first verses. So Paul had to explain it to them. He had to do some apostle splaining. We usually don't like it when people explain things to us. 
But we need that. Sounds condescending, but he is, after all, an apostle, and this is, after all, an inspired text. That's what he does. So I'm going to read these first verses again. He says, this is how one should regard us. Listen up. Servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of a steward that a man be found trustworthy. That is faithful, dependable. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment. You catch that? It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, here's the first warning, do not pronounce judgment. Do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each will receive his commendation from God. Number one, don't pronounce judgment. This is the point that Paul gets to in this paragraph. But before getting to it, he says some important things about the nature of Christian leadership. And, and in so doing, he picks up on what he said in chapter 3 and verse 5 when he said that, um, excuse me, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. He's picking up on that. He's saying that leaders are servants, but they are a special kind of servant called a steward. A steward. Now, a steward is a servant who manages the affairs of another. In the ancient world, you had these estates. You had these households, these families that could be quite large with land, not only family members, but a great many other servants besides. Now, the steward was not the owner, but he was the manager and the distributor of what belonged to another, to the owner. He was a trusted servant, and he made sure that the affairs of the state were well run, and he made sure everyone was fed and things kept moving along swimmingly. That was the job of the steward. And Paul said that he and Apollos, and by extension Christian ministers, are stewards. They manage things on God's behalf. He's the owner. They, he said, stewarded the mysteries of God. And the mysteries of God is a shorthand way of talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, this wisdom of God. And the main thing that is required of a steward was faithfulness, trustworthiness, dependability, reliability, not creativity, although there's nothing wrong with that, not eloquence, although there's nothing wrong with, not initiative, although there's nothing wrong with those things. He was just expected to faithfully get up every morning, put on his shoes, and do his job, and do it all day. And then the next day, to get up and do the same thing again, over and over, day in and day out, rain or shine. He was expected to be faithful, to be trustworthy. Not necessarily successful because that's really not in his purview. The steward, that servant may water, he may plant, but it's God who gives the growth. God's the one who does that. What the steward does is faithful, trustworthy, responsible, carrying out of his job every day. And apparently the Corinthian church was evaluating leaders, but they were not doing it based on this criteria. It says later in the chapter they were doing it arrogantly as if they knew how this should be done. They were judging. They were actually pronouncing judgment. And we have to understand that judging in a full and final sense 
They were pronouncing judgment fully and finally, and in doing so, they were out of line. They were actually out of their depth because they were doing something they were not competent to do. Paul says, do not pronounce judgment. Another way of saying this is don't jump to conclusions. Now, he does qualify this. He says, don't pronounce judgment before the time. Before the time? What does that mean? He goes on to say, before the time when the Lord comes. Now, that's a reference to the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. That's the day when Christ returns. And at that time, when the Lord comes, He's going to do some things. He's going to bring to light those things that are hidden in darkness. You see, there are things currently that are hidden in darkness. They're withheld from our vision that we don't know. And when that hiddenness of those things, uh, when, when we're not fully cognizant that we're not aware of things, we can then pronounce judgment, we can jump to conclusions. But the fact is, as Paul's saying, we're not omniscient. So we're not competent to pronounce judgment. When the Lord comes, He will bring to light the things hidden in darkness, and He will also disclose the purposes of the hearts. In other words, He will reveal motives. We can't know the motives of other people. We can guess, but we can't know for sure. We can't read minds, so we shouldn't jump to conclusions. So I'm playing golf last May. I'm playing Poolsville, which is a golf course way out in the middle of nowhere, and there are no other people around, and I'm playing with a friend, and I know him a bit, and he's wearing a mask. Now, these days, masks are a big deal. Did you know that? I know people who think that if you don't wear a mask, you are threatening their health. And I also know people who think that if you wear a mask, you are being conditioned by the government to become a lemming so that you will jump off the next cliff when they tell you to. That's the spectrum, okay? And there are all kinds of things in between. So we're out here in the middle of nowhere, and he's wearing a mask, and so I, I wonder why. And so I just ask a question. I say, Paul, why are you wearing a mask? He said, ah, my allergies are killing me. The mask helps. Oh. Well, see, that falls somewhere within the spectrum, doesn't it? But I had no idea. Now, I could, and I'm sorry to say, but I have jumped to conclusions over such things. Paul says, don't do that. I can't know the purposes of your heart, so I shouldn't jump to conclusions. Final judgment is the Lord's job, not mine. Paul said, it's the Lord who judges me. In the overall scheme of things, God is the only true and final judge. He says, if you judge me, it's a small thing. If a human court judges me, in the overall scheme of things, that's also a small thing. He says, I don't even judge myself in this sense. He says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't acquit me. It's the Lord who judges me. Now, please understand, Paul is not saying that he is above evaluation. In other places, he encourages self-examination. It's judgment that is final, he says, that's off limits. See, we have a way of writing people off fully and finally if we so judge them that way. In doing that, we're putting ourselves in the place of the true judge. And because we can't know the thoughts and intents of the heart, and there are things hidden in darkness, we can be very foolish if we judge in that way. Now, that does not mean that we cannot make provisional evaluations. As a matter of fact, we're doing that all the time. We are evaluating other people and things all the time. We have to do that. You're evaluating right now this sermon. Is he sticking to the text? Is he just telling me what he thinks? Is this really true? You have to do that. That kind of evaluation is appropriate. 
provisional, provisional judgments are, are appropriate. I mean, when Jesus said about false prophets, you'll know them by their fruits, he was telling us to evaluate the fruit of people's words and actions, especially if they present themselves as prophets. So we're making provisional evaluations all the time, and that's fine. Uh, when Jesus said, do not judge, that you be not judged, he was talking about hypocritical judgment. He said, first, take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll be able to see to take the log out of your brother, the speck out of your brother's eye. So we should be uh, more uh, skeptical and distrustful of ourselves than we are of others. Another way of saying that is we, we should love others and we should not judge in a way that is either full or final because we don't have all the facts. So don't pronounce judgment. That's what he's saying here. Uh, by the way, there's one other thing Paul says in this section that it comes at the end of it that I think is, it, it arrests my attention. He says, when the Lord comes, each one will receive his commendation from God. Did you notice that? I'm almost ready to hear him say, when the Lord comes, each one will receive his condemnation from God. And, and I'm thinking that because that's often how I regard others. Now, oh, condemn you, I condemn you. Oh, you're out of here. I'm going to have nothing to do with you. Be careful of that kind of attitude. That's the world's way of thinking, and it's all around us. As Christians, we have to be very careful not to jump to conclusions and pronounce judgment. My brothers and sisters, I'm speaking to myself as much as I am to you right now. I find this very challenging, but this is important. This is how we're to regard leaders, and this is how we are to regard one another. So that's the first point. Don't pronounce judgment. Do not consign anyone to outer darkness. It's not your job. You're not competent to do so. The second warning is don't be puffed up or don't boast. He goes on to write, he says, I've applied these things, what I've just told you about, to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn by us not to go beyond what, what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Puffed up, inflated, in favor of one against another. That's what they were doing. I'm a Paul Paulus, Cephas, eh. I, you know, that's what they were doing. Paul will tell them later in this letter, in chapter 8, that mere knowledge has a way of puffing up, but love builds up. In verse 7, Paul puts his finger, though, on the basic problem he, when he asks, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast? Why do you act as if you did not receive it? He said, don't be puffed up. Don't boast because everything you have, everything you have was given to you. That is a huge statement. And if we can get a grip on this, it will aid us in humility. Everything you have is a gift from God. Therefore, do not boast. Do not be puffed up. Let's tease this out a bit. Material blessings are gifts from God. What we might call natural abilities are also gifts from God. Are you able to grasp computer theory? That's a gift from God, a gift I do not have. Do you have athletic ability? That's a gift from God. That's a big deal when you're a kid. When you're 70 years old, it doesn't matter much anymore, but it's a gift from God. Were you born into a wealthy family? Well, yes, but I worked hard to get where I am. Well, that's great. Who gave you the ability to work hard? Hmm. Who gave you the gifts of sight and speech? You know, we hear a lot about privilege these days. Privilege is a gift. But there are different kinds of privilege. Should you feel guilty about your privileges? 
You know, just as we have different gifts distributed by an all-wise God, we have different privileges and different degrees of privilege. Now, well, what about the poor? They have little privilege. Well, in one sense, that's true, relatively speaking. But remember this. Jesus said, the poor have the gospel preached to them. He didn't say that about the rich. But what did he say about the rich? He said that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He told a parable about a rich man who ended up tormented in flames and a poor beggar who was escorted by angels into heaven. Jesus said the poor have the gospel preached to them and they are actually more inclined to listen to the rich who think they have no need. Now you need to put that into your equation about privilege. Would you rather really be rich? Be careful what you wish for. Because if we think only on the level of this present world, we're not thinking as we ought. We're not wise. One of the greatest theologians of modern times, Herman Bobink, said this, the knowledge of believers is unique in that they view the whole of life religiously, theologically, and see everything in God's light from the perspective of eternity. From the perspective of eternity. Subspecies eternitatis. They see things from God's perspective in the light of eternity. Do you view life from the perspective of eternity? Everything you have, everything you are, is a gift from God. And he knew just what to give you and what to withhold from you. He knew what was be best in terms of spiritual riches and in terms of spiritual riches. Paul has already said to the Corinthians that all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life or death or things present or things future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Now, what is it that you and I lack? But if it all comes from God, and if everything you have is a gift from God, then why do you boast? Why do you compare yourselves or your leaders with another? In doing this, my brethren, we are not wise. Don't pronounce judgment and don't boast and act puffed up. This is not the way leaders are to be regarded. Don't choose your favorite and play one against another. They all belong to you. Finally, don't misunderstand the times you live in. Now this is a little bit more implicit. So looking at verses 8 through 10 again, he says... And now, let's make sure we understand this. He is speaking ironically, bordering on sarcastically. And he can do this, by the way. Paul is their father in the faith. If we read a few verses later, he will, you'll hear him say, you have a lot of instructors, but you have not many fathers. And it was by God's will that they heard the gospel through him. Humanly speaking, Paul fathered them in the faith. And fathers can talk to their children in a way that other people shouldn't talk to their children. So Paul's okay saying this. We shouldn't speak like this, but Paul can do it. He says this. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. Oh, and would that you did reign, that we might reign with you. For I think God has exhibited us, apostles, as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we've become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. There he's picturing a Roman triumphal procession 
When a Roman general would win a battle, he'd bring back all the booty and the prisoners in a triumphal procession back to Rome. They would applaud him. At the very end of the line would be the prisoners and the prisoner kings. They were condemned. They were going to die. And they're being paraded now to show this. And Paul says, it seems to us that God has made us apostles last. He's put us at the end of the procession. We're a spectacle, literally a theatron. It's like people are going to the movies and laughing at us. That's how they're regarding us. Not you, but us. This is how we see it. We're fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. Now, the Corinthian church was misunderstanding something here. They thought they had already arrived. They thought that the kingdom had already come in its fullness. Now, they were partly correct. And remember, Paul's speaking ironically here. So he's contrasting their estimation of themselves with his own personal experience. They are already kings. They're already rich. They're already wise. They're already strong. He, on the other hand, is poor, dishonored, a spectacle. They look great. He looks ridiculous. He's a fool. And he's the apostle here. He's the big guy. So what's wrong with this picture? They had it upside down. We live in an upside down kingdom. The kingdom of God has been called the upside down kingdom. Or actually, it's the right side up kingdom. It's the world that's really upside down. But we live in a kingdom where the first are last and the last are first. It's a kingdom where the one who is servant of all is actually the greatest. Where those who regard themselves as wealthy, all-seeing, and well-dressed are told by their Lord that they're poor, blind, and naked. It's a kingdom where if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for Christ's sake, you'll find it. It's a kingdom where it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's a kingdom whose king was falsely accused, arrested, mocked, condemned, and literally crucified, but who actually ends up on top, who's worshipped as the king of kings and the Lord of of all lords. But right now, you see, he can only be seen if you have the eyes of faith. It's not apparent to everyone now. It's only apparent to the eyes of faith. And the Corinthians were jumping the gun. They thought they'd already arrived. They were only partly correct. You see, the kingdom of God has come, but it hasn't come in its fullness. It is already, but it's also not yet. Jesus said, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Kingdom present. But he also said to pray, thy kingdom come. Future. You see, the kingdom is present and future. It's present to the eyes of faith. One day it will be apparent to all, but that day hasn't come yet. So, if you ask the question, kingdom of God, is it present? Or is it future? The answer is yes. The Corinthians had what theologians call an over-realized eschatology. They had the already part down, but they missed the not yet. They thought they were reigning as kings. And Paul said, oh, would that it would be so that we might sit on the throne with you. But then he breaks off from his sarcasm and he says in the last verses, 11 through 13, he said, look, to the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed. We're buffeted. We're homeless. We labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat, we speak kindly. We've become and are still like the scum of the world the refuse of all things. Paul's not complaining, and he's not looking for sympathy, and he's not writing to shame them, he goes on to say. He's writing to admonish them as a father 
to his children. He's their father in the faith. He brought them the gospel. And he cares deeply about them. He wants to help them. He wants them to see clearly. So he tells them that true Christian leadership is still marked by suffering. That true Christian discipleship is still marked by suffering. That the world will not love you for preaching a crucified Messiah. As Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you also. My friends, we are fools for Christ. Do you realize in the world's eyes we look ridiculous? We've followed Europe in that now we are a post-Christian culture. It used to be that Christianity was in some way, shape, or form part of the American landscape along with mom and apple pie and baseball and Christianity. Well, it's not that way anymore. In some ways, it's actually a good thing because now, radically, we can stand out. But in the world's eyes, we do look ridiculous. We've been standing here singing to someone that we cannot see as if we could see him. And why do we believe that we can sing to him? It's because he rose from the dead. Oh, really? Where do you find that? Oh, it's, it's in the Bible. The Bible tells me so. Oh, really? The Bible? Try telling that to your introductory philosophy professor at the University of Maryland and your classmates and then notice the puzzled looks. They will laugh at you, you fool. But as I said from this pulpit recently, maybe we're not so dumb after all. But don't misunderstand the times. The kingdom has not come in its fullness. It is only seen and perceived and experienced through faith. Just don't become puffed up. We have nothing to boast about in ourselves. Now we have all that we need, but only because God gave it. And don't pronounce judgment. We're just not competent to do so. You know, what I think really ties all these warnings together and this whole passage together is something called humility. I think this passage is a plea for humility, for you and me to see ourselves at God, as God sees us. You know, uh, if we are, as I believe we are, in a culture war, we want to fight and win. Well, we have to use the weapons that our Lord used. Humility, love, acts of kindness. The passage is a plea for humility, for you and me to see ourselves as God sees us. We are not in a position to judge fully or finally. Yeah, we can make provisional evaluations, but let's do that charitably. Let's recognize our limitations. Let's be careful in our evaluations. Secondly, everything we have is a gift from God, so let's not get puffed up. Let's not choose our favorites in such a way as to put others down. Let's appreciate leaders as gifts to us and appreciate God as the giver. And then thirdly, we haven't arrived yet, so let's not act as if we have. The kingdom has not come in its fullness. It will, but in the meantime, we've got a long way to go. So let's humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. I think that's a wise course of action because God promises to give grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So let us humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. If there's any exalting to be done, he will do it in his proper time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the wisdom of Scripture coming to us from the Apostle Paul, one of the wisest men who ever lived, who considered himself a fool for Christ's sake. 
O oh Lord, well might we walk in his footsteps, consider ourselves the same. We are grateful for what we have. It has come from your hand. We are grateful for the blessings we have, but we also recognize our limitations. We're finite, we're mortal, we are still sinners by nature. But you have acted on our behalf to forgive our sin, to cleanse us from unrighteousness, to reunite us with yourself so that we are no longer alienated, to give us Jesus Christ with whom we are in union individually and as a body. And as we prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. I pray, Lord, that you would guide us in our thinking so that we approach you with proper humility and self-examination. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.